tips of my toes to the top of my head. They're gonna see I'm yours. The tips of my toes to the top of my head. They're gonna. Tips of my toe to the top of my head. They're gonna see I'm yours. And the tips of my toes to the top of my head. They're gonna know I love you. And the tips of my
Dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy as deep cries out to.
come to the fountain and dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. that is our prayer that you would come for us soon Lord we wait for you we long for you we cannot wait to see you face to face we cannot wait for you to come and to to take your church Lord to take your bride and God we are so anxious to to get to see you face to face to get to know you as we are known Lord and, and we thank you that you that you continue to minister to us that you continue to grow us in your word and to draw us closer to you and just that you give us work to do here on this earth, Lord, that you tell us to, to be occupied until you come, Lord, but we are waiting. We are longing uh, just to be that generation that is taken home by you, Lord. We, we cannot wait to see you. And so we just pray that you would just direct our hearts towards you through your word, that you would speak to us, that you would um, uh, just woo us and draw us closer to yourself. And we just thank you for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, a blessing to be with you. It's a blessing to join those that are here uh, and those of you that are at home. As we're doing our pre-recording, uh, this will be our last weekend pre-recording. Next week, we're going to be picking up with live services, and we'll be live streaming. But uh, we're excited that uh, some of you have joined us for our pre-recording. Um, we have one more uh, pre-recording as well on Tuesday for our Wednesday services. So if you want to be a part of that, you can watch the announcements and uh, you can come join us on Tuesday uh, at 5 uh, and a little bit before that to arrive. And then uh, uh, we're going to be shifting back to our regular service times, our regular uh, uh, live stream and those kind of things. So uh, just a couple more pre-recordings and then live services. So. Uh, announcements as far as our live service so next week the 24th we're gonna be picking back up with our live services we do have a limited space uh, so because of the social distancing and all those all those kind of things uh, we have uh, a reservation list and so you have to uh, go ahead and go to our website and follow through with the uh, reservations not all of you that want to come may find a spot so we have to be flexible so I remind you of that uh, blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken uh, so let's be ready for that. This is going to be a work in progress. <laughs> there will likely be some issues we have to work out and change and flex and those kind of things. And then as soon as we get it situated and we know what we're doing, we'll move to phase two and start over with all of that. So uh, that's going to happen soon as well. So thankful for that. Uh, and whatever that means for us, uh, hopefully we'll open up more and more with phase two. Now, uh, as you make reservation, if you aren't able to make a reservation, if it fills up, uh, I know that can be frustrating. I apologize for that uh, beyond our, uh, uh, our control on those things. If it's filled up, let us know. Uh, contact us, email the church, and we'll see if we need to add services or uh, we possibly will just, we'll possibly do the Saturday uh, service 
Uh, we'll figure out a time for that, all those kind of things. Um, so just be ready for that, be flexible. And uh, you can visit our website uh, for announcements, uh, have our, our uh, app on your phone with the notifications on. Uh, there's information that will pass through those uh, um, venues and as well our social media. Uh, so I encourage you to, to uh, check all those things out. Uh, so again, flexible, uh, communicate with us, uh, reserve your spot uh, for the service next Sunday, and then also Wednesday night to uh, the 27th, uh, we'll be having our communion service, so you can come for that, but you, again, you'll need to reserve a spot. And uh, if you're gonna be at home, you can prepare by getting elements for uh, that communion service on the 27th. Uh, so we're looking forward to all those things. Uh, along with that, on the 24th, and th there is a need in the community, uh, always a need, we're gonna be having the blood mobile here on the 24th. So if you're uh, able-bodied to give blood, to donate, uh, the uh, blood mobile will be here uh, that uh, morning into the afternoon. Uh, you get a free shirt, T-shirt uh, as well. Uh, but uh, you can be a blessing to that need in our community and a blessing to those uh, that serve with the blood mobile. So I encourage you to be prepared for that. Even if you don't get a spot uh, in, in our reservation, in our limited uh, amount that we can fit here, maybe you want to drop by to the blood mobile uh, and donate blood, and it'll be right here in our parking lot. Uh, so that's uh, the 24th. Again, our first live service, May the 24th, uh, and the blood mobile as well. Now, if you're in a Bible study and you're joining Bible study with Zoom and all those kind of things, make sure you're in communication with the leaders as things are shifting now where we're allowed to uh, uh, get together. Uh, some of the groups are meeting uh, in parks. Some of them are continuing with Zoom. Uh, so just uh, be in communication. I want to encourage everybody to be a part of a small group. Fellowship, obviously, uh, in this time is really important, always really important. But we just, you know, with the um, limitations that we have, I think we all have a refreshed, renewed appreciation for fellowship and being together. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, make sure you're making an effort to do that, to be a part of fellowship, uh, to connect with one another, to uh, reach out to one another. All right. Well, today we are uh, in Second Timothy, so let's make our way to Second Timothy. Get your Bibles. Turn to chapter four. Second Timothy, chapter four. We'll look at some other passages as well, and you can follow with me if you'd like uh, to those other passages. Um, uh, if not, you can just uh, listen in. Uh, encourage you though. Have your Bible opened up to Second Timothy, chapter four. If you're watching on video, you can pause to get your Bible. Uh, just uh, make sure you come back. Now, uh, as we uh, uh, begin, I also want to look at Psalm 133. Familiar psalm. If you want to turn with me, you can, or you can just listen in. Psalm 133 reminds us of the things that uh, you know are really what we've just been talking about and fresh on our hearts, really relevant for us. Uh, God speaking here uh, through David. And David writes in this psalm, in Psalm 133, uh, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Not just the notion of uh, getting together, but to get together with a, a heart that's knit together, right? Unified uh, in the sense of fellowship, the sense of family. And you just pause on that and you recognize uh, for us today uh, how good it is to belong, right? How good it is to be a part of the family. How good it is uh, to be uh, a child of God, adopted into the family, that uh, we have a place, we have a purpose, uh, we're loved, uh, we're cared for. Uh, how good it is, right? And to come together in that acknowledgement, to come together uh, in that uh, fellowship uh, that, that God so uh, graciously gives us. Behold how good and how pleasant. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. As a parent, there are those family times that you have, especially as the kids get older and you begin to have grandkids and, and the families kind of come together for those special holidays or family events. And th those moments as a parent where you can pause and everybody's getting along and you don't want to say it too loud because you don't want to you know ruin the moment but you're you're just in the you might tap on your wife's shoulder and say everybody's getting along it just warms your heart 
Now, admittedly, there are those moments where, uh, you know, things get tense over a card game or something like that. But, you know, that, that place of coming together, right? Uh, for the Heavenly Father to say this to us, how good and how pleasant it is. Uh, so, church family, right? Just to acknowledge that and to know that and to know our, our part in being unified, our part in dwelling together, our part in seeking fellowship and being a, a blessing to fellowship. He continues here and he says, It is like uh, precious oil, the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, uh, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Now this is the priestly anointment, uh, the anointing of, uh, of Aaron and his priesthood. And so it's this unique anointing. Uh, it's drawing, uh, you know, the initiation of the priesthood and the intent of drawing the people to God and God to the people and fellowship, the ministry of the priest. It's a unifying work uh, in the sense of that being portrayed here poetically, uh, that fellowship that we have as the family of God uh, unified together. Verse 3 says, it is like the dew of Hermon, Mount uh, Hermon, uh, descending upon the mountains of Zion. Uh, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Uh, as we uh, uh, have stepped through this season, uh, Israel has been blessed with a, an abundance of rainfall this winter. And as they come out of the gray, drab uh, deadness of winter, uh, all of a sudden the blossoming, especially of the Golan Heights and Mount Hermon and, and the mountains of Zion uh, and the flowers and the green grass. And you know that, that imagery is what's being displayed here. The fruitfulness of that, the harvest of that, uh, the provision of that, right? Uh, and, and coming out of the deadness of winter into the vibrant uh, life uh, uh, of springtime. That's the picture of this, and that's what fellowship is like. Right? You just let that speak to your heart, especially in this time, as where many churches are meeting already, and we're going to be meeting uh, live next week, and some of you are already here. You know, that sense of this. It's, you know, coming out of the deadness of winter and into the vibrancy, right? The, the drawing together, the unifying work of the love of Christ, the drawing us together as the family, uh, how good, how pleasant it is to dwell together in unity, how good it is to come out of that grayness and deadness and numbness and step back into fellowship. And the green and the vibrant and the fruitful and the flowering and the color and uh, to come back to that, right? It, it causes us, uh, winter does give us that blessing and that gift. You know, you come out of that, especially if you grew up in the snow and in the, the north, the great white north. You know, you come out of winter and the, that cabin fever, right? You come, that first day you can wear shorts, right? Do you remember those days? Uh, and your dog would be freaking out because he can go outside. <laughs> you know, that, those experiences of stepping out of winter, that's what we're uh, about to experience in our lives here as we step out of this and how good, right? There's something more than just the practical, obvious out in the front a physical experience. There's the spiritual uh, reality, right? How good and how pleasant it is. Right, can, I, can I encourage you and call you to thankfulness, right? appreciation, right? all those things that may have gotten your craw and bu bugged you and bothered you about this person or that person. You know, that it, that love covers a multitude of sins, right? And all of a sudden those things don't matter, right? I saw a meme during this time that said, I'm starting to miss the people I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't for me that was, somebody else wrote that but you get the point so just what a sweet place for us right as we step into this into this can but let's just be refreshed and renewed with a reborn uh, appreciation uh, for the love of god the family of god and and, and let it just be kind of like that a little reminder of the great feast that we're going to be, that wedding supper of the Lamb, how great that reunion will be, how sweet. Oh, can't wait, right? 
And what a blessing that the Lord would prepare our hearts with this experience to appreciate uh, these things. So uh, let's uh, take that to prayer. Uh, let's set our hearts on this. Let's be thankful. Uh, let's give ourselves to fellowship. Uh, let's uh, purpose ourselves for these things. Uh, let's pray that God would speak to our heart and fellowship with us in and through his word uh, by his spirit. So uh, you pray right now. I'm inviting you to engage in that, connect with him in that. Uh, and uh, I'm going to pray as well, and we'll step into our, our Bible study. Father, we uh, thank you for fellowship. Lord, with each other, the family of God. Lord, uh, the giftings, the, all the different people, all the different uh, unique blessings of each character, each personality, uh, Lord, all that, the, that they offer to the family of God, Lord, that you would knit our hearts together. Uh, Lord, what a privilege to belong and to be loved, to be the beloved, to be the redeemed, uh, to be your people, Lord, to be a, a adopted family, uh, uh, sons and daughters. Lord, it is such a great privilege. Lord, and not only with each other, but even more so with you. Lord, that our heart is yours. And you've seen fit and made a way for us to be in your presence. You have uh, opened the path, the way. You've removed the obstacles. Uh, uniquely removed our sin, Lord, to allow us to be reestablished in your love. Lord, we thank you for that. And we can't wait for that final reunion. Lord, stir our hearts, purify us, prepare us, ready us, uh, give us a, a, a desire uh, and expecting, anticipating heart. Lord, looking forward to that. And Lord, stir us with these things. Lord, draw in those that don't have this. Lord, even right now as I pray, if there's somebody listening, watching that doesn't have this, Lord, welcome them in in your grace. Wash over them with your forgiveness. Listen, receive that right now if that's you. He's made a way for you to experience his love. Say yes to Jesus right now. Lord, we do that. We say yes to you. We open up. We ask you to wash over us with your love. Lord, draw us in. Knit our hearts. Uh, deepen our experience of your love. Uh, and let us approach you, uh, Lord, with a thankful heart. Speak to us through your word, by your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, uh, do a work. Move our faith forward. Glorify your name. Reach the hurting, the lost. Lord, uh, let your love be known. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we turn from that uh, perspective and, and that understanding, we turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, we are going to read a portion of this that we've already covered, but want to be reminded of. Uh, uh, this is considered to be Paul's last letter. It is definitely his last letter uh, to Timothy. Um, and uh, as he writes these things, uh, his days are short. Uh, the uh, experience that he has uh, uh, looking forward uh, is uh, the end. Uh, you know, he's, he's in that moment where th things that uh, matter are really coming forward. The words that he speaks are uh, weighted, uh, a poignant, uh, important, uh, and he speaks these to Timothy. Uh, it's it's a shame when we read this that, you know, that we take uh, these things for granted, but the fact that we have immediate communication, right, that we can email or call or text or, you know, Zoom or whatever, you know, we can do all those things immediately. Uh, they didn't have that, and sometimes we kind of forget that. Uh, Paul would have written this letter, and it would have been hand-delivered, and how long does that take? Right, and there's there's got to be a part of you that as you're reading this in the in the uh, backdrop of the scene and the imagination of the scene, you're considering maybe Timothy doesn't get this in time. Right, maybe maybe Timothy gets this uh, after uh, Paul has actually gone to be with the Lord. Uh, it, you know, those kind of things settle in the reality of it as you consider that, and um, it does kind of bring. Uh, a stronger uh, emotion to this text. Uh, so uh, let's make sure that we're allowing this text to be emotional as it is, uh, poignant, uh, weighted, and let it speak to us like that, right? Uh, Paul here, facing his execution, saying these last words, uh, the important things rising to the top. 
Uh, I'll remind you at the beginning that Paul comes again to these things of the word. Uh, at the end of chapter 3 into chapter 4, uh, Paul is directing Timothy to commit to the word, to let the word have a work in his life, and to preach and to proclaim that word to others. Uh, it's the uh, core uh, of ministry, uh, the critical uh, work of ministry. And so Paul's encouraged Timothy with that. Uh, he gives Timothy that. And then he transitions uh, to that last um, directive to Timothy, right? That last ministerial uh, directive to Timothy, preach the word, you know. Uh, let the word have an effect on you. Let it continue. Preach the word. Then he says in verse 6, for I am already being poured out. So this is where he switches to uh, his state, uh, you know, his last uh, uh, treatise, his, his expression of what he's, uh, what he's gone through and been through. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, and here he brings us in, and not just Timothy, but all of us, not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. Just, and it stirs, even the things that we've already mentioned, but what we have to look forward to, that moment of reward, that moment of God blessing. And this is not an issue of salvation. This is the reward of running the race, of fighting the fight, of enduring in the faith. This is God blessing us. This is his gift to us. And, and, and as you note that, Paul is looking forward to that. Can't wait. He's not talking about the, the pain of his execution. It's just amazing that this would supersede, superabound over that, that he's looking forward to uh, that moment where he steps from this body to the, to his, to the heavenly experience, uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. He's looking forward to that moment of hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, he's not even discussing really that issue of <laughs> the pain and the struggle, the transition even. It's just amazing to us. Now, as you read that, you want to note the, the, just the, the, the perspectives, the layers of poetic ways that God's describing through Paul here, uh, that he's being poured out. It's not about me. It, it, literally, uh, the, the life of the believer is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, to love your neighbor as yourself. It's others-centered, and you note that about Paul. Paul did not, he's not concerned for self. He's trusting that God will take care of his needs. You see that in the rest of this text. But as he's trusting the Lord to care for him, he's considering others. He's poured out his life for the Lord. And you'll read through this and you'll see his, his heart is for others. He's fought the good fight. So you have these you know, almost bullet points. Poured out as a drink offering. He fought the good fight. He's finished the race. He's kept the faith. You know, that those things should be... Uh, motivational, directive, uh, mentoring to us uh, to, to consider what Paul is going through and the depth of it and the severity of it, and yet this is where he's at. And you note the, the uh, finishing of this, right? It's not uh, how you start or where you started from. It's how you finish. It's where you finish, right? It's where you're headed, uh, and that's such a refreshment here. What you recognize here as Paul is saying these things is that something in Paul's story significantly changed the direction of his life. He was a Pharisee committed to the works of religious acts, uh, study and all those things. It was in his effort and his strength. And then he meets Jesus and he meets the grace of Christ and it rag radically shifts uh, the not only the direction of his life, but the way of his life, the behavior of his life. And there really is, as you read this, this, this need for us to recognize this. There is a way that that is required in all of us. That shift, right, that moment, that poignant, pivotal, redirecting moment where you come to terms with the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it uh, you know, the, the way that that happens, the the particulars of that is individual to you, but the personhood and the ministry of Christ is the same for all of us. The same Jesus 
And the same work, the same powerful grace that radically shifts Paul's life and the way he lives uh, and his ability to live that out is the same Jesus, the same grace that you must meet. And it has to have that impact on you. As Paul says all these things, his heart set on his soon uh, seeing Jesus, uh, his soon arrival to heaven's shores, he says in verse 9, be diligent to come to me quickly. Now, as I mentioned, it hinted earlier, uh, we don't know that that happens. It may have, but we don't know. It's that kind of uh, urgent uh, time uh, in Paul's life. Uh, be diligent to come to me quickly. As you shift in this, I want you to recognize that as Paul is saying again these um, these last words, the, the things have, you know, as you, as you are in difficult moments, uh, the unimportant things fall aside, fall to the wayside. Uh, you filter down to the important things. The important things uh, rise to the top uh, and you recognize what matters, how you lived your life, right? And what matters here is not uh, another business meeting. And what matters here is not another client or another job or another... You know, what matters here uh, isn't those things that so often we've invested so much in. What matters here uh, is not how many loads of laundry you got done today. Uh, what matters here is people and the Lord, right? And you shift to this and you recognize that, that Paul begins to shift to the people in his life. Now, as you read this and you recognize this, it's not just the uh, warm, fuzzy relationships. It's the deep uh, rooted uh, connections. It's some of them are the disappointments. Some of them, are, uh, some of the things he mentions here are the betrayals or the casualties of relationships. Uh, but in all of this, what you note here is the endurance of relationships, the importance of others and people in our lives. And, and you let that speak to you in the moment, uh, because better to deal with these things now, better to be in the right mindset and have the a, a wise perspective in these things uh, than to be at the end and regret, right? To be at the, the, those last moments like Paul, but to regret that you don't have, you haven't lived like this. And you haven't uh, had the relationships and invested in people uh, with the love of God like Paul did. Uh, better to deal with that now, to bring correction to your course now than to wait to the finality as Paul says this, he says, be diligent to come to me quickly. I encourage you again as we read this, let the emotions flow, right? Hear this. Hear what Paul is saying to his uh, special uh, son in the faith, this close friendship, this fellowship that he has. And he says, come quickly. And right with that, he says, for Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, he has departed from Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Now, as you note that, uh, it seems that Demas has left for carnal, for fleshly, for selfish, for you know, his personal wants and desires, seeking after the world. Uh, there was a time that he was with Paul and following the Lord, but now he's slipped into worldliness. And it, uh, as Paul says this, it, there's just a broken heart in that uh, and, and not that God's done with Demas and maybe even Paul's mentioning that because as I depart Timothy you keep watch for Demas right uh, you know be there for Demas uh, to let him know that and these other two that are mentioned here uh, are, don't seem to be uh, departing because of worldliness but instead because of ministry uh, uh, Titus obviously is the one directed by Paul and faithful to those things. He says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Now, Luke is unique, right? Luke is a, a physician. Luke is a historian. He's the writer of the book of Luke. He's the writer of the book of Acts. Uh, and there are some uh, scholars that surmise in these writings of Acts and Luke that he's actually writing these things for Paul's defense before Caesar in this moment, right? So that important role in, in loyalty and, and 
the friendship that Luke has with Paul. Luke, and as we note this as well, Luke is um, being a physician. It was a different thing back then. Uh, physicians were enslaved. Physicians uh, were uh, servants. Uh, so they're, they're in a different position in that culture. Uh, and uh, uh, Luke, uh, in, in that s situation here, coming alongside Paul, uh, there's a real sense that uh, things have radically shifted for Luke as well. In the book of Acts, you see Luke join Paul, uh, and uh, as they're heading into Philippi, you see the uh, pronouns change for them and, 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 and uh, directed as Luke is not with Paul. And then in Acts, when they step into Philippi, uh, you see the pronouns begin to say us and we, because Luke joins Paul at that point. Uh, Luke has been critically important, and it seems that as everybody has abandoned Paul, some for ministry's sake, some for selfish, sinful reasons, Paul says, Luke is here. Luke is here. And, and I've joked in the past, when Paul says, only Luke is with me, uh, you know, what is he, chopped liver? You know, if Luke is sitting there, maybe he's even writing this for Paul, dictating this for Paul, uh, for, uh, you know, only, only Luke. Uh, I need some help here. Luke's the only one here. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> I, I joke about that. I think that's, this is more thankful uh, that Luke has been so faithful. Uh, that's the real tone of this. And then he says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And we're going to come back to Mark, but it, it, he is a... It, uh, a high point of this, uh, uh, this um, list of people. Uh, verse 12 continues, as this, Antichicus I have sent to Ephesus, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus uh, at Troas when you come, and the books especially the parchments. Uh, so Paul here, as we close this paragraph here, Paul here is facing his execution, but there's a sense here that he is uh, at the same time occupying until he's called to be with the Lord, right? Occupy till Jesus comes. We might be, you know, we need to know this, that Jesus could come any moment, perhaps today. But at the same time, we need to live in such a way uh, that we could have a long life before us. Uh, so we need to be faithful for, to the Lord and being uh, mindful of the possibility of days, long days. Uh, so Paul here facing the executioner, but at the same time, bring my books. Right? I want to read. I want to study. I bring my cloak. And the, there's a lot of discussion of what that word means, but you know, likely just uh, something personal for him that he wanted. It could be the cold of winter coming. Uh, it could be other aspects of that, uh, that he's asking uh, for Paul to bring those, um, Timothy to bring those things. Uh, now, as you continue with this, you come back to Mark in verse 11. And if you're familiar with the story of Paul, uh, you want to be refreshed in this and be reminded uh, Mark and Paul had a, a, a dividing point, uh, had an argument, all the way back in Acts 13, and you can read this on your own. There's brief mention. It's not a drawn out in the detail of the narrative, but there's a brief mention that as they depart Cyprus, as they're on their first missionary journey, and I say they, it's Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark, this Mark. Uh, and at that point, as they leave Cyprus, it's kind of a uh, uneventful uh, uh, time in Cyprus. There's not a whole lot that happens there. Uh, there's, I think there's one conversion that happens there. Uh, Mark decides to go home. And we're not told exactly why. Uh, then in chapter 15, so we're in 13 when he leaves and goes home. Uh, he's a young man, likely a teenager, maybe even like 16, 17 at that point. He goes home. And then in chapter 15, they're getting ready for their second journey, missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas talking about the details and plans. Barnabas says, let's take Mark. And Paul says, absolutely not. <laughs> now, Luke doesn't tell us who's right. And I think it's important that you don't do that either. Uh, if God had to determine who was right, he probably would have let you know if it was important to us. I personally think that they both were right. And I'll just say quickly, I think Barnabas... Uh, his, he's an uncle or a cousin to John Mark, uh, and he takes him under his wing, uh, and he needs to help this young man through a difficult time. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, uh, says to this young man, listen, you can't do that. You can't just, you know, commit to something and, you know, and, and walk out because something got hard, you got homesick, who knows what happened, but you just can't do that. 
And uh, I think a young man needs to hear both of those. I think there are those in a young man's life uh, that he needs support and understanding and grace and mercy. Uh, but there's also that need for somebody to come along and say, hey, listen, that's not faithful. That's not what a man does. That's not what you do in serving the Lord. You need to let your yes be yes. You need to be faithful to those things. And I think they're both needed. Uh, but what's interesting in the process, in the progression, is as you walk through Mark's story, God's not done with Mark because he bailed out. But Barnabas is there. And Barnabas comes along, and, and in that point of Acts 15, uh, they, Paul and Barnabas separate their ways because their disagreement is so severe. Uh, but there's a way that God expands ministry. Now you have two missionary teams out there. And interestingly enough, Barnabas takes Mark back to Cyprus. <laughs> where Mark left for whatever reason. So they go back to where. I think that's interesting. Uh, Paul takes Titus. And, and as they continue in ministry, uh, you begin to see things you know, work out. Uh, Paul mentions Mark in Colossians. Uh, he mentions him in Philemon. Uh, he speaks of Mark being a fellow worker and time's going on. Uh, progression is happening. Um, uh, Peter will mention in his writings, Mark and, and, and Peter and Mark apparently uh, become very close and it's the gospel of Mark is said to be Peter's story dictated by John Mark. Uh, so that's an interesting way that you see the maturing and the relationships coming alongside Mark. And Peter calls him his son in a very poignant fashion in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, so you see different uh, uh, relationships building Mark up and God discipling Mark. You remind yourself that as things are going on, uh, Paul is growing as well in the Lord. Uh, Paul is deepening and maturing. Uh, they're both, God's working on both of these men uh, in, a separate, in separate ways, different ministry, different things happening in their life, but they're being discipled. Uh, Paul will say in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that familiar section, uh, we're all new creatures in Christ, right? We're not going to judge anybody anymore because they're a brand new creature in Christ Jesus, talking about the believers. Uh, and he goes on and he says, you know, that uh, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, right? The word of reconciliation. I look at that and I go, listen, if Mark and, and Paul can't be reconciled, uh, then it really uh, is, uh, it brings skepticism to the gospel. You know, is this true? If we can't reconcile, is this true? Is this real? And when you see uh, at the end uh, of Paul's ministry, he can say, listen, bring Mark because he's useful. Think about the story because he's useful. What's happened in Mark? <laughs> God's not done, right? And not only is God not done in working in Mark and maturing him and bringing him up out of that place where he quit and walked out. Now, uh, Paul can say of Mark, he's useful. Right? Can I encourage you? I don't know what you've been through, of what places of um, uh, inadequacies have been revealed or weaknesses or even issues of sin or, or of failure. Uh, listen, God's not done. And you need and you want progress in this. Right? You want to grow. There are things that we need to leave behind. There are things we need to let go of. There are things in us, me included, that need to change. God's working in Mark. God used Barnabas, and God used Peter, and God used Paul. All those different ways that those men dealt with Mark. He needed that. And at the end of Paul's life, for Paul to be able to say, he's useful to me. And so you note that, that God's worked in, Bar uh, in Mark's life, and he's matured, but he's also worked in Paul. And that Paul, even though he can come across as strong and harsh and blunt at times, he's gracious and he's merciful, and he's forgiving, and he's willing, and he's available to see reconciliation and see relationships brought back together. He's willing, and so God's worked in Mark, and God's worked in Paul, but ultimately what you need to see here is God's worked in the family of God. God has seen fit. This is, in the clarity of this, the father wants his kids to dwell together in unity. And separated and disconnected, God was moving this forward. God's a reconciler. 
right? For Mark and Paul to join that. That's just a, it's a beautiful uh, reconciliation. And it, it's not only uh, for us to read uh, uh, emotional and uh, dramatic for us to read just a great story of reconciliation, but it models for us, right, how we should live. And it also reveals to us who God is and how God works. God can reconcile. You might have relationships that you're not even speaking, right? Not able to, whatever reason, separated, divided. Uh, God's not done. Listen, we can, I encourage you, if you have people in your life that you haven't talked to in a while, can't talk to in a while, you keep praying. <laughs> pray for God's grace to bless them and to grow them and pray for God to work in your heart. Uh, we have weapons of warfare that are far different. We can pull down strongholds. Uh, we can come against those fine-sounding arguments, things that have divided and separated and hurt and wounded. Uh, we can bring those to the Lord, and he can reconcile and reunite. How amazing at this point of um, severe suffering and worrisome things on the horizon, Paul's execution and this is what he's talking about. Mark's useful to me. Uh, he continues in verse 14 and shifts uh, to something far different, uh, another relationship. He says, Alexander, uh, as he speaks of this, this is an enemy uh, to Paul, to the ministry, to the church, to the gospel. And so severely, and we don't know all the details of this, but so severe is his opposition that Paul needs to warn Timothy of him. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Uh, you know, the, Jesus says that we are to be as wise as serpent and gentle as doves. We need to be aware. We need no, no, not to be uh, so gullible and naive uh, that we allow people to take advantage and manipulate and overrun us. Uh, there is a stand for the gospel that needs to be made. And, and God, uh, and Paul here, inviting the Lord to do what needs to be done. Right? Uh, and I find that interesting. Of the, the, the men of the Bible, the writers of the Bible here, they so often say things that seem severe, but if you pause in this moment, he says, may the Lord Paul doesn't say, and if I get my hand on that guy, <laughs> right? Or Paul's not saying, Lord, let me at him. You know, Paul's saying, Lord, you do what needs to be done. Right? And, that, and that's gracious because the Lord is always uh, pro providing and presenting discipline and judgment in our lives uh, as unbelievers that would lead us to surrender to him. Uh, and, and even if uh, Alexander... Uh, has opposed, there's grace. Uh, but the Lord is, a, is, a, is the one that will bring that about. Now, Alexander likely never surrendered, but the opportunity was there, and that's Paul uh, giving this to the Lord. This is the prayer. Now, as you note this, verse 16 continues, and he says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Uh, that initially might sound like Paul's a bit upset, but it may be that they weren't able to be with him. Uh, like Luke, because Luke is uh, a servant, because Luke's enslaved, he has no standing in the court, so he couldn't come. It might be why, and scholars consider this, it might be why he wrote Acts in Luke, because that's the only way he could be there, is through writing. Uh, he couldn't be there presenting himself as a witness. Uh, so uh, Paul might be saying, listen, it, it wasn't uh, to their uh, detriment or their fault. Uh, God be gracious to them, uh, but I've been alone in this. Paul's letting you know the reality. He's not pulling punches. He's not glossing over this. He's letting you know that this has been a very lonely time for Paul. He's saying to, to uh, Timothy and, and asking for Mark as well. He's saying, come quickly. Right? I've been isolated. I've been alone in this. I haven't had the support that I'm used to. Right? And, and he's talking about the people in his life. And as he says this, 
He, look at verse 17. This is so amazing. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. Not that his defense could come through. Uh, not that, you know, court things could, you know, be appropriately. No, he says that the message, the gospel, right, that the message of the gospel might be preached fully through me and that uh, all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me, will deliver me from every evil work and preser preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I'm going to read the rest of this for the sake, and we'll come back to comment on this. Uh, Greek Prisca and Aquila. Uh, some translations have Priscilla and Aquila. And the household of Onesphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, uh, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. And do your utmost to come before winter, uh, because it, it, travel would be limited, not just because of the cold, but uh, the, the boats won't sail. Uh, the storms are too difficult. Uh, he couldn't get there. So do your utmost to come before winter. Uh, Eubulus greets you, as well as uh, Putin and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. See, so there are people there, but there's a way that he's isolated and limited in the, uh, the ways that he can fellowship with them. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Now, as you note this, Paul, again, in this discussion, is talking about the people, the relationships. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the friendships, uh, the, the body of Christ, uh, how important. And, and as he says that, at the same time, he's in a position where he is isolated. They can't reach him. Uh, he's alone. Uh, you, you know, that all of that uh, loneliness and isolation has had an impact on him. And right there in the middle of that, verse 17, the Lord stood with him. Now, we know this from Scripture, and I'll remind you, I've said this recently. We so often will say things like, where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. And I understand the purpose of that and the idea of talking about that. The, uh, you have to care, be careful with that. Uh, that verse speaks of church discipline and all of that. But I, I'm being gracious. It's okay that we say that. But I want to make sure you're understanding this, you're clear on this. Uh, you, Jesus indwells the believer. You're never alone. You bring Jesus with you to fellowship. You are the body of Christ, the temple of God. He's with you. He indwells you. And so you note that you're never alone. It clearly says to us, he never leaves you nor forsakes us. Repeatedly, he tells you. that That's not left you as orphans. You stop and you think about the Godhead. He says that the Father will indwell you. He says, I will indwell you. Uh, and the Holy Spirit will indwell you. It's a rather amazing reality. You're never alone. Now, as you read this, I want you to understand this very clearly. As I read this, I do not think that Paul is just talking about flowery, spiritual terms here. I think he literally, uh, physically means that Jesus came to his prison cell and stood with him. And the reason that I think that, and you can consider it for yourself, but why would Paul say, Jesus came and stood with me? Because Jesus has never left Paul. Jesus is what I just explained. He's indwelt by the Trinity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit indwell him. He's always in fellowship. Jesus has made a way. You can, at any moment, you can turn and be in with the presence of the throne room of God through prayer. Paul's never been alone in that sense. Why would Paul, why would Paul even say this if it wasn't something significant, different? I think, personally, something poignantly happened here in his cell. I don't know exactly what, uh, but my consideration is that Jesus bodily, physically came and stood with Paul. That's just my thought. Now, as you look at that, uh, Paul evidently speaks of a fellowship and a connection with the Lord that affected him. Look at what he says. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. You know, that's what the word encourage means. The word encourage means to give strength. Right? Encouraging words to give strength. Uh, that's what Jesus does uh, with Paul here in the prison. And it's for a purpose so that the gospel message, the truth of Christ, could be preached fully. Now, I point back to what Paul has said in verses 6 through verse 8. 
I think that's what Paul is saying here. It's not just that you know he's before Caesar at some point and the right words come out. That is likely the case. But it's more than that. What Paul, I think, is saying here is that in the, the full reality of his life, he fought the good fight. Jesus strengthened him so that he could finish well. I want to finish well. Right? But it's not in my strength. You know, as Paul comes to the end of his race, you know, in this time where it's been difficult and hard and there's been betrayals and there's been enemies, as Paul comes to the end of his race, you can recognize this. He didn't quit. He endured. Right? He finished the race. It's too often in the Christian story that we hear somebody say, oh, you know, so-and-so hurt my feelings, or this event happened, or I was betrayed, or they stabbed me in the back. And they leave the church. And maybe they don't leave in a physical sense, but they leave in that sense of that, oh, they may still attend, but they aren't. Brother, I'm not going to be part of that. I'm not going to give myself my time, my energy, my fine. I'm not going to give to that. I'll still be there because I'm supposed to be there, but there's some Paul didn't let that happen. Can I remind you of the betrayals that he lists here, including Mark, uh, but in the enemies and the casualties and the oppositions, he, none of that phased him. He continued to run the race. Uh, we need to see this. Listen, fighting the good fight is enduring in relationship. It's not quitting. And let me be very clear on this. It's not quitting on people. It's not quitting on yourself. Why? Because Jesus has not. He continues the work. He finishes the work. Now, Paul tells that to the Philippian church, and he tells it to them. When I quote that verse, I've so often quoted that verse. He who, who began the good work in me will complete it, right? I've so often stated that verse for my sake and my cause. And it's true, but as much as it's true for me, it's true for you. And as much as it's true for Paul, it was true for John Mark. And as much as it's true for John Mark, it's true for Demas. If Demas was truly the Lord's, God's not done. Do you have any John Marks in your life? Are you a John Mark? Do you have a Demas in your life? God's not done. You fight the good fight. You don't quit. And in this moment, Paul's picking up stride. <laughs> Before we close this text, remember we've kept going back to the book of Ephesians. As we study second, first and second Timothy, Timothy was a pastor there, asked by Paul to pastor that church. Paul writes early on to the church at Ephesus, and you see a lot of the overlap and the different things he's communicating uh, to Timothy. He also communicates in a different fashion, different way, different angle, different perspective, the same things. And you come to these two texts, of, or these, these uh, letters, Ephesians, First and Second Timothy. You come to them and you read it, and this overlap gives you a broader, deeper understanding. So go with me back to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. In the, in the end of Ephesians, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 19. Now, as I read this, he's talking to the church at Ephesus. Uh, some of the names, Timothy included, some of the people that you see uh, in the uh, closing of 2 Timothy, Paul's talking to them. And you think about the relationships, right? And you kind of let yourself see the fellowship. Can you just visualize, let the, the story be painted in your mind. See visually uh, the church at Ephesus gathering together. When Paul was with them and when Paul writes and, uh, to them and when they read these things. Uh, see the names listed in Paul's closing. Uh, see the faces in the fellowship. See them around the table loving on one another, the friendships that are there. And hear what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Now, he's speaking about this distance from the Father. That's no longer true because God's grace, Jesus Christ, has made a way for you to enter in. 
But he's also speaking about as we're entering into the grace of God, we're fellow citizens together with the saints, as verse 19 continues, and members of the household of God. Fellow citizens, members, fellowship together, right? The household of God. And then he shifts, and it's not just the idea of a, the family of God. Now the, the picture is the building of God. He says, having been built, verse 20, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy, grows Think about John Mark, right? Think about Paul growing together. <laughs> imagine so what so often happens. Imagine in the life of Paul and John Mark that that uh, argument and division, uh, John Mark's leaving the team and uh, walking out on them. If that event had rooted such a bitterness and resentment in the two that they refused and never, never, ever considered each other again. Imagine what they would have missed out on. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And Paul writes this in the progression, the experience, the story being written in his life as he's seeing God work in him and in others. Paul writes this, and it's personal. And there's, he's not just writing religious words here. He's writing about the reality of what the church at Ephesus knows and sees, what Paul knows and sees, what he sees happening in the middle of the story with John Mark and himself, what he sees God doing. He says this, in whom, verse 21 again, the whole building being fitted together grows. Verse 21, I should say, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And I love the story of John Mark reconciling with Paul. I love that Paul at the end of his time says, John Mark is useful to me. The healing of those words, the reconciliation, the restoration of friendship. What that said, can you imagine John Mark Hearing from Timothy, and Timothy says, hey, Paul wants you to come and see him before it's all over. He wants you to, you're useful to him. Can you imagine how that washes over the healing of those words? Now, can I remind you in the progression of this, uh, just note in Ephesians that Paul begins to talk to the church. He prays that they'll united together. They're going to receive this love in chapter 3. In chapter 4 and 5, he begins to talk about how to live as a believer, how to follow the Lord in grace, uh, in the strength of his grace. And he begins to talk about relationships at the end, right? Husbands and wives, uh, you know, workers and employers, jobs. Uh, uh, he, he talks about kids and parents. He talks about all of that stuff, and Paul's directing these things and ministering. These. And then Paul says, uh, put on the full armor of God. There's a sense that the battle, one of the poignant places of the battle, why you need the armor of God is because of relationships. Because there's a fight that needs to be fought. And it's not a fight against each other. It's a fight for reconciliation. And as you note that, What's the work of Christ in this? As you come back to 2 Timothy chapter 4 in the close of this, Jesus came and stood with Paul and strengthened him. Not just that Paul could be the orator, you know, say the right words and be, you know, uh, flowery with his words and convincing with his words in, in the courtroom, but that his life would proclaim the gospel to the end, to the finish line. Who, who enabled Paul? Jesus did. Who's, who's the one that stood up with Peter and said, I will build my church? Jesus. 
And you know and recognize who he's talking to. And you read these words and you recognize he's not just talking to Paul and Mark and Timothy. He's not just talking to the church at Ephesus. He's talking to us because he still built his church. Right? And what needs to happen to me, and what needs to happen in you, and the reconciliation and the growing together and the grace of God being built together as an indwelling of the Father, that's happening in us. And as much as Paul could declare to you his story and tell you in this poignant, dramatic moment, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That, that, that Paul could fight the good fight. That Paul could finish the race. That, that, that Paul could proclaim these things. That he kept his faith. Listen for us. The book of Timothy closes with this. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul's not just saying sincerely, <laughs> right? Whatever your closing is, you know, he's not just yours truly. Paul's saying the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand what Paul, when Paul says that the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit? Man, the, the, the point, the, the reality of that, the weight of that, what Paul means by that, don't overlook that. Uh, Paul, remind yourself that Paul says, the Lord strengthened me so that I could do this. The Lord strengthened so that reconciliation could happen. The Lord strengthened so that I could fight the good fight of faith. Uh, to love God and to love others. To pour out my life for him and for others. To, to run this race, not just to run it, but to finish it. Paul says, the Lord strengthened me so that I could cross the finish line, stretch out, not being carried, o carried over or dragging over, uh, not resting on the curb, but stretched out, getting that second one full stride, burning it out, right? Going with a blaze of glory and falling into the arms of Jesus and hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul's proclaiming that. And then Paul says to you the same. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Boom. I mean, bow like fireworks, like like broadcast. Like you just, the proclamation of that is not just how do I wrap this up? Yours truly. No, it is a proclamation of power, of authority, of hope, of strength. That God could take a ragtag bunch of people like this, like this, like us. That God could take even broken, severed relationships. That God could call to the prodigals. That God could call to the hurt. And he can bring reconciliation. That he can build us together. I want to run that race. All right? I want to cross that finish line and not only embrace Jesus himself, but those who I've lost along the way. Those that, that you know, there's, there's hurt, there's resentment, there needs to be reconciled. Those that have been casualties, those that I might say betrayed, or, you know, the hurt, the pain, the things like that. That, that, that there is a day coming when all of that will be reconciled. I can't wait to embrace the body of Christ. <laughs> I mean, how, how relevant today. <laughs> Church, we have good news. There's a lot of bad news out there. There's a lot of fear, doubt, anxiety. We have hope. <laughs> we have security. We're the beloved. We're the redeemed. We know where we're going. We're running the race. Let's fight the fight. For the cause, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of others, for the reconciliation, the ministry that we have. Paul would close that thought, thought and say this to us. For we are ambassadors of Christ as though he were pleading through us. <laughs> Reconcile. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become 
the righteousness of God in him. Wow. 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 Would you join me in prayer? Let's take these things to the Lord and wherever you're at. Maybe you feel alone or maybe you have broken relationships or maybe just the worry and the anxiety is troubling you. Let's remember who set the course, who's finished the race, who's gone before us. Let's set our eyes on Jesus. Uh, so begin to pray. Believers, pray. If you're outside of this, if you feel distant and you don't know, uh, maybe at one point you gave your heart to Christ, but it, it's been a struggle. Uh, listen, right now, understand this. He's not done and he's fighting for you. He wants you to know his heart. Uh, maybe for the first time, maybe in a recommitted fashion, would you right now, in this poignant time, in this critical time, there's an urgency when I say this. I don't know if you'll hear this again. You need to hear it now. You need to respond. Surrender. Humble yourselves. Turn to Jesus. Ask him to wash over you with his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. Uh, admit the things that you've done that are sinful, that are wrong, that are selfish. Ask him to forgive you. Trust your life to him. Follow him. Ask him to secure you in his love. Do that right now. Father, we thank you. Lord, we turn our hearts to you. We pray that you would stand with us, that your grace and your mercy would be with us, with our spirit, or that you would do a work in your church through us, that you would work the ministry of reconciliation, the truth of the gospel, that we would be your ambassadors. And like Paul, that you would strengthen us to do these things. Make your message clear in our story, in our lives, in our words. Lord, build your church. Knit our hearts together. And bring us along with a heart of gratitude and appreciation. Lord, we can't wait to see you face to face. To reunite, to reconcile to the full with the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.